to destroy. This was a just complete take a right turn. Everybody right now starting not starting not like next week or you know next month, but starting tomorrow. Figure out how your job changes. Bills. You know, message to the company was let's go find lots of ways uh, for us to to now engage in this new battle. That's probably, you could argue, the beginning of the browser war. In 1993, the internet was unknown and unloved outside a tiny circle of hardcore computer hackers and scientists. But by 1995, the situation had changed dramatically. Now, thanks to the wizardry and the manic energy of a bunch of engineers here in Silicon Valley, the internet was becoming a full-scale phenomenon, a technology being compared in its importance to television and the printing press. Leading the charge was Netscape. Its browser was quickly becoming the gateway to the web for millions of people. The company had just hired a respectable CEO, and revenues were rolling in. The future looked incredibly rosy, or did it? This man certainly didn't think so. His name is Gary Reback, a well-known antitrust lawyer in Silicon Valley, who back in the summer of 1995 was limbering up for the fight of his life. Like many in the Valley, he knew that Bill Gates would be coming after the internet, and he knew better than most from a career of clashing with Microsoft on behalf of his Valley clients, that when Gates came after your business, one thing was certain, there would be blood. Now Reback had been hired by Netscape, and right away he saw that the young company had grossly underestimated the threat that it was facing. Netscape's business plan assumed that Microsoft would either obey the law or, or someone would force them to obey the law. Now, I suppose that's not an unreasonable assumption. After all, if you start a business, you don't expect a competitor to just burn your plant down. You don't expect a competitor to go to your distributors and threaten to put them out of business if they carry your product. But you know what? That's exactly what Microsoft did. The problem for Netscape was that Microsoft and Bill Gates now perceived the young company to be the primary threat to their continued dominance. In the opening salvo of a high-tech war, Gates dispatched a special group of envoys, including Thomas Reardon, for a face-to-face -face powwow behind enemy lines here at what back then was Netscape's corporate headquarters. What resulted was a meeting that would be one of the most controversial in the history of modern business. That the Microsoft Netscape meeting took place here, that much we know for sure. But what actually happened behind closed doors remains the subject of intense and bitter debate. The Microsoft version goes something like this. We go down there in June of, uh, of 95, and we had this free-roaming discussion with them about how we would work with Netscape. How would we work with them on web servers and on browsers, and how we might use, you know, how Microsoft Word could work with Netscape software, etc. It was a broad discussion that went on, I think, six hours, a whole day of discussions. It was interesting. I thought it was a really collegial, easygoing meeting. Hey, that doesn't sound so bad, but Netscape's version of events was just a little bit different. They came to the meeting and they made him an offer. And the offer was, I win and maybe you're there, or I win and you're not there at all. That's, those are the two choices, basically. It was kind of like that scene from The Godfather. I mean, Netscape got made an offer they couldn't refuse. I was a baby. Um, and me and some of the other kids there went down and, yeah, Godfather-style threatened Netscape. It's just, it's absurd. It's absurd on its face. Microsoft offered us $1 million for unlimited access to all our technology, and it'd be a one-time fee. So essentially they said, we'll buy your whole business for $1 million, take it or leave it, because if you leave it, we're just going to copy everything you do. I remember thinking at the time, if this isn't illegal, it should be. If what Netscape claimed was true, it meant that Microsoft had broken the law. American antitrust law, to be precise. The point of that law was to constrain the behavior of companies that held monopolies, which most sane experts agreed Microsoft had with its Windows operating system. Within hours of the meeting, Netscape instructed Gary Reback to alert the U.S. Justice Department about what had taken place and to start laying the groundwork for a lawsuit against Microsoft. But Thomas Reardon smelled a rat. Why did Netscape have antitrust counsel? Not just any antitrust counsel, but the legendary Gary Reebok, the guy known, famous, for going after Microsoft for years, trying to stir up a government suit against Microsoft. You know, 
effectively we had been had. The meeting had been set up. A paranoid theory? No doubt. At the time, Netscape was the hottest young company in high technology. So why would it need to try and set up Microsoft? On Wall Street, analysts and bankers had begun to sing its praises, talking about the bright prospects ahead if Netscape were to launch an IPO. I looked at our projections for Netscape and um, realized that there was a chance that Netscape could be the fastest growing software company ever. Jim Clark starts literally pounding the table and he's like, we have to take this thing public, we have to take it public right now. And everybody in the room was like, really? <laughs> like, are you sure? You can just almost predict that we were gonna have something between 60 and 80 million in revenues for the year. Now hold on here, wait a minute, let's think about this. Before Netscape, the standard rule on Wall Street was that a company needed to have at least a year, and preferably two, of strong and growing profits before it could even think about going public. But Netscape in August of 1995 had only been in existence for a year. It didn't have a dime of profits, and it had no idea how it was going to make them. And as Jim Clark told me at the time, the only reason that he wanted to go public so fast was because he needed a giant windfall so he could build the world's biggest computerized yacht. So under these circumstances, going public was lunacy for Netscape, right? Wrong. On the day of the IPO, Netscape stock went through the roof, igniting the internet boom that would rage for the rest of the decade. I was on the uh, trading floor, and I went over to talk to our trader, David Slain, and Matt DeSalvo, who ran our trading desk, literally stepped in front of me and, and prevented me from getting close to Dave. And I said, what's going on? Uh, and he said, there's a lot of volume in the trading in the shares, and Dave, you know, Dave needs all the focus that he, that he has. And he starts saying, you know, biggest IPO ever, you know, biggest rise, it's like all this crazy stuff. I'm like, wow, people really like us, I guess. <laughs> the internet went from nothing to, you know, the biggest story to hit the media and sort of consumer consciousness in, in a long time. Um, and just, you know, at that point, then the, the level of attention just, you know, escalated off the charts. I invested five million in the company, and on the day of the IPO, at the close of trading, I had made $663 million. Just about enough for Clark to buy his yacht, and enough for Netscape to become a public company, with shares trading at $120 and an overall valuation of more than $2 billion. The Netscape engineers, young men in their 20s, were now filthy rich celebrity nerds. Sure enough, it went straight to their heads. High on their own fumes, the Netscapees began to think they were invincible. They treated even their allies with arrogant indifference. And as for their enemies, one in particular, they violated one of Silicon Valley's cardinal rules, don't moon the giant. Back in the days when no one would give the finger to Microsoft, here was Mark Andreessen in the press over and over, heaping scorn on the company. Mark Andreessen was very clear on many occasions that that he didn't think much of Microsoft, he didn't think much about the quality of Microsoft software, uh, and he thought that Windows was dead. Windows is going to be a bag of poorly debugged device drivers was one of his sort of most notable quotes. A poorly debugged set of device drivers? What does that even mean? To people who speak English like you and me, it doesn't sound so bad. But if you're an engineer, the kind of person who speaks geek, Mark Andreessen's comment was the equivalent of a slur on Bill Gates's mother. And it played straight into Gates's hands spurring Microsoft on in their burgeoning war against Netscape. For the developers in Windows, who were some of the best developers in the world, um, to have their baby thought of as a set of poorly debugged device drivers was maddening. And, uh, and it was insulting. And it was got them motivated. I actually personally postered the walls of our hallways with pictures of the, the top executives from Netscapes and some of the, the quotes that they made simply to motivate people to know, you know, these are the faces of the people you're fighting against. Then you started actually reading articles where people are like, Netscape, the new Microsoft? Like, no, we're the, we're the, we're the Microsoft. We're the new Microsoft. With his engineers spoiling for a fight and emotions running high, on December 7th, 1995, Gates let the world know that he had Netscape in his sights. Microsoft planned to drive Clark and Andreessen's startup to an early grave with a web browser of its own, Internet Explorer. Microsoft hastily arranged a press and analyst meeting in Seattle. Uh, they did it by design on the anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, and it was called the Pearl Harbor Day, and the view was they were going to attack uh, Netscape with all that they, with all that they could.